Have you ever seen the turn horse? So it's been a, a lot of time, um, you know, when I was reading this book, um, forming an opinion on it as I was reading it and trying to think about how I would introduce it and how I would initially discuss it. And I think one of the marks of a good book is that your opinion on the book as you're reading it is dynamic. Um, you know, when we find, um, uh, books that we end up DNRing or DNFing, I should say, um, we, you know, books that we don't finish. The tendency is that our opinion on the book tends to remain the same as you go along. And sometimes it can be a good thing. Sometimes it's just like, you know, a book makes you feel good all the way through, but even then there are highs, there are lows, there are um, things that you may like more or less about a book. But a, a, a book where your opinion stays stagnant um, and typically negative, that's a book that you put down and you don't finish. I have to say that I hit a point in this book pretty early on where I considered it. Uh, I considered putting it down. And I'll explain all that. But um, let's do something else first. I wanna talk about Philip K. Dick and a personal experience that uh, has been reported that he had that is relevant to this. And then we'll sort of get through a proper introduction of this book. So just bear with me. Admittedly, uh, Philip K. Dick maybe wasn't the sanest guy. And um, it's not really an accusation or uh, something negative I'm trying to say about him, but it's well known that he had psychological peculiarities and uh, a lot of those psychological peculiarities were uh, exacerbated by drug use. So I think we can, we can sort of establish that those two things are factual. I want to read for a second. There's a, this salon article, I'll, I'll link it down in the description. There's a snippet about an incident um, that occurred with Dick in the early 1960s. And I just want to read this real quick. In 1963, Dick turned to Christianity after a terrifying vision. By the fall of that year, Dick's third marriage had devolved along with the emotional stability of both partners. Dick even managed to have a psychiatrist uh, he shared with his wife and uh, briefly commit her to a mental hospital. Sometime during the fall, uh, perhaps following the assassination of JFK, Dick was walking to the isolated shack he'd rented as a writing office. He looked up at the sky and saw a face, a quote, vast, a vast visage of perfect evil that had empty slots for eyes. It was metal and cruel, and worst of all, it was God. For once, Dick was not just writing the weird, he was staring it in the face. Uh, kind of goes on. Uh, this is slightly relevant, so just bear with me for a minute. The visage uh, haunted him for days, possibly weeks. Uh, he told his shrink, and he told the Episcopal priest at St. Columbia's Church in nearby Inverness, who identified the figure as Satan and gave Dick a uh, holy unction. The exact relationship between the slot-eyed vision and Dick's embrace of Christianity is murky. In some accounts, it was the cause, while in others, he explained uh, the turn to the church as Anne's last-ditch effort uh, to attempt to save the marriage. Okay. Interesting information to carry forward. So this is uh, Philip K. Dick and Rogers' last name. Um, it's, I bet I could figure it out with a little bit more research, but I'm... Um, it was unclear exactly what Zelazny's role is in completing it. I got the impression that a great majority of this, uh, even though this was, I believe, originally published uh, in the early 1980s, I feel like the vast majority of it was written by Dick in the 1960s. Hi, I'm from the future. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to pop in here and say that, uh, as it turns out, 
when Dick started writing this in 1964, uh, he realized that he didn't know enough about Christianity to actually complete the book appropriately. So he gave it to this dude uh, named White. Uh, White was supposed to kind of go in and fix some of the theological stuff, but apparently the manuscript was too big of a shit show for him to do anything with it. So it sat on his desk for a few years and then Zelazny was in White's house and uh, ended up finding the manuscript, taking it home and writing a letter to Dick saying, hey man, I got your manuscript, we're gonna work on this together. And then the two of them worked back and forth on it for the next few years. And uh, until it happens that Zelazny's cat pissed on the manuscript. And then Doubleday had this really intense uh, policy that you got, you have to submit original manuscripts, not copies. Um, because they tried to assemble copies to you know, deal with the piss pages. They called Zelazny and gave him, you know, the runaround over the phone about it and uh, gave him the whatnot. And uh, Zelazny said, sure, you want the original manuscript? Fine. So he sends them the cat piss manuscript. And uh, apparently it's something that he continued to think was hilarious for the rest of his life. So as it clearly is. Back to the point. That scene that we discussed from his past, uh, about the slotted eyed figure. These are direct images that are present in this book. That image in particular of the uh, slot eyed deity is a present factor throughout this. I have not read, I have read more Dick uh, than I have Zelazny. And it's my impression that especially the first two chapters and possibly the last three or four chapters were all written by Zelazny, uh, by and large. There is a difference, a, a stark difference in prose when it comes to the first couple of chapters and the chapters uh, in the bulk of the middle of the book. And, and I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the film The Horse of Turin. We've all seen pretty dark, foreboding, dystopian films. Um, but The Horse of Turin in particular really feels like the setting of the beginning of this. What we have is a post-apocalyptic world and not that far removed from the, post, uh, from the apocalypse. I believe it's generally about 20, 22 years. Within the frame of the book, it occurs in the 1980s. The Apocalypse itself has a known aggressor. Of course, it was a uh, situation that built up uh, amongst nations and a single individual uh, concocted a, uh, a final straw plan. And this plan would essentially make the surface of the earth uninhabitable. It didn't completely make it uninhabitable, but it definitely ruined most cities uh, it ruined the majority of the population and shrunk the population down to a couple of million people. It's all of this is sort of tangent, tangential to um, where we start the story off, but it's, um, you know, but it's essential. What has happened to the disparate remaining human population is that you essentially just have small islands of people. The book takes place primarily in the West, uh, throughout Utah, and Idaho and the population um, of these towns are you know of course cut off primarily from information um, there is some news that comes through some radio transmissions that come through um, but in a group of a hundred or so people um, it's uh, it's mainly cut off out of the cataclysm, the role of Christianity has essentially evaporated and shrunk to basically nothing. And a new church has arisen. And this is the, the church dedicated to the God of wrath, the Deus Irae. Um, to them, to the remaining survivors, the apocalypse that occurred is proof that God was not a loving God. God was a wrathful God and his wrath had intention. Um, the survivors, of course, had, they hung on to the belief that they survived because somehow they were better than those that were killed. 
Um, they recognized that it was the Christian political factors and the uh, basic ideology of um, you know the standard Christian male that uh, drove the world to its destruction. And so essentially this was Christianity's fault. And the reckoner of this is God himself in the embodiment of this man who invents the super weapon that destroys the earth. He is the God of wrath, the one true God. Um, so I, what this boils down to is that this is a theological, I wouldn't even say debate. I wouldn't even call it a debate. It's not a debate. Um, it's theological ramblings in the desolate aftermath of an apocalyptic event. This seems a little cliche at this point. I think we've all lived in a deeply apocalyptic mind state for some time now, but there are redeeming qualities. So the book primarily follows uh, the character uh, Tiber McMasters, who is an armless, legless, uh, what's known as an incomplete. He is the offspring of this new world. Um, a lot of the children born, of course, are mutated or uh, deformed or missing arms and limbs. Um, and so this is just a, a going factor uh, in the populace. And uh, Tabor is no different. He has actually uh, been provided a uh, sort of a post-war invention. Uh, it's a mechanical cart and it has a, a long-term battery in it and a couple of wheels and extensor arms. He is essentially living in this cart. Uh, he doesn't leave the cart. In the cart, uh, there's some amount of self uh, propulsion that it has, but for the most part, it is drawn by a cow. So he is dependent both on the cart and on the cow. Our Tabor has a gift. He is a painter renowned in the small world. And the um, the main church, uh, the church dedicated to the Deus Irae, which has a, um, uh, a very desolate presence in this desolate place, has um, given Tiber the, the mission of painting the physical image of their deity, uh, the God of Wrath. They have a, an old picture that was taken just before the end of the war with the character seated with some people eating fruit in Hawaii. And Tabor looks at the picture and he says, this is, this is not an accurate representation. I can't paint this. This is not the God of Wrath. And uh, he notices the pain in the eyes of the individual. Personally, Tabor is indifferent to the religion. He's indifferent uh, both to the religion uh, focused on the God of Wrath and on the remaining Christians in the town, uh, which have a, a small representation uh, by another character. Tabor initially realizes that in order to paint accurate portrait of the God of Wrath, he must go find him. This is a task that he both uh, he insists upon, but simultaneously has no desire to carry out or complete. Through a series of events, he is, uh, he is encouraged and uh, he is essentially forced into the journey. There is an early accusation by the leader of the Christian church to Tabor. Uh, Tabor actually approaches the man and asks to be converted to Christianity in order to avoid going on this pilgrimage. The Christian priest wouldn't allow it. He had his own motives for Tabor's journey. Plainly, he wanted to see whether or not Tabor could find uh, the Deus Array and paint him accurately, and in doing so, undercut the validity of the religion as a whole. That or simply having Tabor disappear uh, and uh, lost to the wilderness, um, no longer to be an issue. He's denied entry into the Christian church, and then leaves on this pilgrimage. Concurrently, there's another character who is essentially Dick. Um, he is the character uh, Pete, and he is introduced in what I believe is the first chapter of the book actually written by Dick himself. And, you know, Pete is, um, it is a near identical description of the sort of events that Dick was going through in the early 60s with his wife 
and uh, the experiences that Pete was having in his home uh, with his girlfriend. Uh, so essentially, Pete learned early on. He was alive when the event occurred, uh, but he was very young. Uh, so he's grown up in a normal body, basically pilfering the landscape. Oh, what's, what's the video game? I can't think of it with the, with the, with the guy. Anyway, pilfering the landscape. And uh, his fascination is ancient medical uh, technology, primarily pharmaceuticals. So he has a vast collection of pharmaceuticals. And he has very diligently uh, tracked the, the effects of the pharmaceuticals on his psyche. He's very methodically uh, researched the, uh, the effects of all of these pharmaceuticals uh, on his psyche and is attempting to use them to attain uh, visions. He is self-aware enough to know that uh, he doesn't have the religious or mental discipline to uh, attain visions in a, uh, in a qualified religious state. So he's using uh, the pharmaceuticals to get him to that point. And uh, the visions that he receives are the exact visions um, that were mentioned in that article uh, that Dick himself saw. He saw the, the slotted eye god of wrath. In, in parallel with Dick's own life, the, the vision has an effect uh, on Pete. He attempts to bring the vision forward to the uh, Christian leader in the town, claiming that, you know, he's had this vision, this is a legitimate vision, uh, it should be recognized, uh, he should be allowed into the church. And uh, again, the priest sort of denies him uh, based on his own motives. Primarily, he's encouraging Pete to follow Tabor on Tabor's pilgrimage and come what may. Um, Pete is not a murderer, uh, he is morally uh, conflicted, but also very stable. When he begins following Tabor on the pilgrimage, he is genuinely unsure what his actions will be and uh, what will become of the two of them. Once we get out of the first few chapters, which are admittedly very dark, the book takes on a new tone. It was very much needed. Uh, at this point in the book, because I really was about to put it down. I was, I was just about to say, you know, that this is just, this is not the story that I want to read right now. And of course, I'm imagining Warwick Davis as Tiber, armless, legless, in this little unit, traveling ac across a desolate wasteland on a theological quest. And I'm just like, you know, this is, maybe this is not uh, what I'm after right now. But I pressed on. I was rewarded. This is what we got. Let's break it down. We got lizard people. We got dilapidated supercomputer that feeds on human flesh and attempts to lure humans uh, into the basement of the computer so that they can be dissolved in acid and uh, the computer can go on living. We have mutant bugs uh, who are quite friendly and worship a rusted out Volkswagen bug. Uh, we have Russian auto factories uh, with bad temperaments uh, and an inability to follow directions. There is a decidedly Terry Gilliam-esque quality to the uh, bulk of the middle and uh, latter parts of the book. The descriptions of the landscape um, give you this fantastical West feeling. Um, it is a place uh, littered in mystery and destruction and mutants of all kinds. There is the ability to commune and speak with mutant animals on the part of some characters. All of this sort of builds a very rich environment. It is a short pilgrimage uh, in terms of the length of the book. They, they're very concise in the story, but the images it evokes and the types of creatures that you encounter and the personalities that they embody are all very endearing and very genuine 
and true to the magic of the West. There's an older uh, piece of literature, John Bunyan uh, wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, and it is a theological allegory of a man traveling through a wasteland, encountering demons and angels and beasts, and there is an evolution in his soul in the journey. The entire book is allegorical to our journeys as humans in finding uh, our theistic nature and in finding God. And it's a really fantastic book if you like to torture yourself with um, Puritan literature. <laughs> but I couldn't stop thinking about it as I was reading this. I, on some level, whether he was aware of it or not, I feel like Dick was channeling Bunyan, and this is his Pilgrim's Progress. This is his his take on the allegorical uh, theistic journey of man. And the theistic problems, um, the theology itself that's grappled in this is fairly shallow. I don't think that you could write volumes on the positions taken by the characters and their various realizations about the nature of their theistic reality. That said, I, I think that for a science fiction book, it's just deep enough. And, uh, at least in the bulk of the latter half, it's, it's paired with a description of their current reality that is, as I said, endearing and unique and fun and filled with very friendly mutants. Um, I wasn't sure whether or not this was going to be one of those books that led you through fear of uh, strange beings, uh, encounter after encounter, and there was some necessary fear and that was fine. Uh, but I, moreover, I was just generally impressed uh, with the helpful nature of the creatures despite the carnage around them and despite um, the sadness of their universe. And I'm not certain what Dick's intention was there, but it was very satisfying as a reader. And it did lighten it to a point where I, I really did feel in my mind as though um, this is a, a familiar Terry Gillian esque reality that, uh, that I, I fully embrace. So, uh, give it a read. It's a fairly decent book. If you like Philip K. Dick, uh, if you like Rogers Lasney, um, give it a look. I'd really like to hear what other people think about the various writing styles that can be detected. Like I said, it's my opinion that the first couple of chapters are absolutely Zelazny and the last few chapters are absolutely Zelazny, but the bulk of the middle is Dick. Give it a good, give it a good read. I, th I think you'll enjoy it. It's quick. There are copies of it out there. It can be found. Um, yeah, I think it's probably also available in various compilations and whatnot. So, Hey, thanks for watching the book report. Uh, appreciate you sticking with me as I get used to facing the camera. Um, I hope you have a really nice weekend and a great week. Take care.